In this video, um, let me just give you an overview of the topics we're going to cover. We're going to talk about how to convert between radians and degrees, how to find a coterminal, one positive, one negative, how to find a reference angle, how to evaluate sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent, um, without knowing the unit circle. But we'll talk about the unit circle as well a little. How to also find double angle formulas, how to evaluate those half angle formulas, um, using the sine alpha plus beta equation, how to solve for trig equations, verifying identities. We're going to talk about how to find amplitude, period, phase shift, vertical shift, how to graph trig functions, how to use law of sines, law of cosines, and how to find the area of a triangle in different situations. So let's begin. Let's say if you want to convert degrees into radians. So let's say if you have 60 degrees. If you want to convert it to radians, simply multiply by pi over 180. That's all you got to do. So here we can cancel the zeros. If we divide it backwards, 18 divided by 6 is 3. So we get pi over 3. Let's try another example. Let's say if we have 150 degrees and we want to convert that to radians. Multiply it by pi over 180. Cancel the zero. Now 18 does go into 15, so in this case we're going to reduce it differently. We can divide both numbers by 3. So 15 divided by 3 is 5, and 18 divided by 3 is 6, so you get 5 pi over 6. Now the next scenario is working backwards. Let's say if you have 2 pi over 5, and you want to convert it to degrees. Multiply it by 180 degrees over pi, which is the reciprocal of the last, um, the last one. Notice that the units of pi is cancel. So 2 times 180 is 360, so we have 360 divided by 5. And let's see. Let's see if we could do that without a calculator. I'm going to break it up into 350 over 5 and 10 over 5. Because 350 plus 10 is 360. 35 divided by 5 is 7, so 350 over 5 is 70. And 10 over 5 is 2, so you get 72 degrees. Now, let's say if you have an angle. Let's say if your angle is um, 40 degrees. How can you find another coterminal angle? One which is positive and the other which is negative. A coterminal angle is another angle that is on the same spot but that has a different value. To find two coterminal angles, Simply add 360, so this would be 400, and subtract 360, so this would be negative uh, 320. If you add 360, you're going to go around a circle once. So 40 and 400, they're in the same location. If you subtract 360, you're going this way. And so negative 320 is in quadrant 1 as well. So that's how you can find uh, two terminal angles. But sometimes they'll give you this question in radians. Let's say if you want to find the coterminal angle of 2 pi over 3. 2 pi and 360 are the same, so what you got to do is add 2 pi and subtract 2 pi. So that's how you can find a negative and a positive coterminal angle. But what you need to do is get common denominators. 2 pi is the same as 6 pi over 3. So the answer is 8 pi over 3. That's the positive coterminal angle. To find a negative one, let's subtract 2 pi over 3 by 6 pi over 3, and we're going to get negative 4 pi over 3. So that's it for coterminal angles. That's all you got to do. Next, we're going to talk about how to find a reference angle. Let's say if you have an angle that's 60 degrees. This is quadrant 1, quadrant 2, quadrant 3 and quadrant 4. This is 0, 90, 180, 270. And 0 is the same as 360. Alright, so if your angle is 60 degrees, it's in quadrant 1. The reference angle is the same as the actual angle in quadrant 1, so it's 60. So let's say if you have an angle in quadrant 2, let's say it's 130. To find the reference angle in quadrant 2, it's simply 180 minus the angle in quadrant 2. So that's 180 minus 130, so it's 50 degrees. 
to find the angle in quadrant three. Let's say if it's at two. Let's say if it's two twenty. The reference angle is simply that angle minus one eighty. So it's two twenty minus one eighty. It's going to be forty. And let's say if you have an angle in quadrant four. Let's say if it's three hundred thirty. The reference angle is three sixty minus the angle in quadrant four. So three sixty minus three thirty. You get thirty. But let me help you to see it visually. So let's say if we have four angles, 50 degrees, 140, 210, and 300. 50 is approximately right there. The reference angle is the angle between this vector, or this line right here, and the x-axis. So that's basically this angle. So in quadrant 1, the reference angle is the angle in quadrant 1. In quadrant 2, 140 is roughly around this area. This is measured from the positive x-axis. The reference angle is the angle between the x-axis and the, uh, the line where the 140 is. So this is 180. The difference between 180 and 40 is 40. So that's the reference angle in quadrant 2. Now for this one, 210, that's in quadrant 3, which is around here. So the reference angle is between that vector and the x-axis. So between 180 and 210, the reference angle is 30. Now for the last example, 300 is somewhere over here. So the reference angle is between that angle and the x-axis which is 0 or 360 but 360 is closer to 300 so it's going to be 60 keep in mind the reference angle is always between 0 and 90 it has to be between those two numbers if you get 120 it's not the reference angle so now let's talk about um, evaluating sine and cosine and tangent functions let's say if sine theta is 3 over 5 and cosine theta is greater than 0. Find the other five trig functions cosine, tangent, secant, cotangent, and cosecant. Now sine is positive and cosine is positive. Cosine is associated with the x variable, sine is associated with the y variable. x and y are both positive in quadrant 1. Now, you need to be familiar with this acronym, SOKOTOA. So let's focus on the SO part. Sine is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse side. So when we draw the triangle, here's our reference angle, which is between the hypotenuse of this triangle and the x-axis. And so here we have sine is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse side. So the hypotenuse is across that box, so this is 5. Opposite to theta is 3. Now if you use Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, you can find a missing side. Or you can know it's a special triangle. It's a 3, 4, 5 triangle, so this side is 4. Some other special triangles you have to know, in addition to the 3, 4, 5, is the 7, 24, 25. The 8, 15, 17, and um, there's the this one more, what was it? 5, 12, 13. Also, any ratios of these numbers can work too. So, like 3, 4, 5, if you multiply it by 2, you get 6, 8, 10, that can work. The 7, 24, 25, if you multiply it by 3, 21, 72, 75, that works as well. Now, there's some other ones, like um, 9, 40, 41, that's an unusual one. And I've seen the 11, 60, 61, if you want to add that to your notes. Okay, so now let's continue. So let's find cosine theta relative to that triangle. So according to Sokotoa, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. This is the adjacent side. It's close to the theta, and that's hypotenuse, so it's 4 over 5. Tangent theta is equal to the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. You see opposite over adjacent, so it's 3 over 4. 
Now, to find secant, secant is 1 over cosine. So it's the reciprocal of cosine. You just got to flip that number. So it's 5 over 4. Cosecant theta is the reciprocal of sine. So it's 5 over 3. And then finally, cotangent theta is the reciprocal of tangent. So it's 4 over 3. So let's try one more example um, regarding that problem. Let's say if cosine theta is negative 7 over 25 and if sine is greater than 0. So here, cosine is negative. That means x is negative. Sine is greater than 0. Sine is positive. So y is positive. In what quadrant is x negative and y positive? So when x is negative, you got to go to the left. When y is positive, you got to go up. So that's in quadrant 2. Now cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. This is the adjacent side. And this is the hypotenuse side. x is negative as you go to the left. So we know this is the 7, 24, 25 triangle. So now that we have cosine, we can find everything else. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so it's going to be 24 over 25. Tangent is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side, so it's 24 over 7, but negative. And secant is 1 over cosine, so it's negative 25 over 7. Just flip that fraction. Cosecant is 1 over sine, so that's 25 over 24. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, so that's negative 7 over 24. Now, there's some special triangles that you need to be familiar with. There's the 30, 60, 90 triangle, and the 45, 45, 90 triangle. Across the 45 is radical 2. Across the 90 is just 2. Now, you might see that same triangle with these numbers. Radical 2 over 2, radical 2 over 2, and 1. Basically, it's this triangle, just you divide every side by 2. It has the same ratio, but I'm going to use this one because, from experience, it works out nicely. Like, it works out very well. Now, for the 30, 60, 90 triangle, across the 30 is 1, across the 60 is root 3, across the 90 is 2. Again, if you divide that by 2, you might see this triangle, which is 1 half, root 3 over 2, and 2 over 2 is 1. But I'm going to refer to this triangle. So let's say if you want to evaluate sine of 30 degrees. Draw your 30, 60, 90 triangle. Across the 30, we know it's 1. Across the 60 is root 3. Across the 90 is 2. So sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So therefore, it's 1 over 2. So let's say if you want to find out uh, cosine 30 or cosine pi over 6. If you don't know what pi over 6 is, just convert it to degrees. Multiply by 180 over pi. And 18 divided by 6 is 3, so 180 divided by 6 is 30. So cosine pi over 6 is the same as 30. And it's adjacent over hypotenuse, so you get root 3 over 2. So let's say if you want to find out what tangent of 60 is. Tangent is uh, opposite over adjacent, so it's 1 over root 3. Now normally, if you have a radical on the bottom, you got to rationalize it. So you multiply top and bottom by root 3, and you get root 3 over 3. But now let's say if you want to find out what sine of 240 is. 240, you need to know it's in quadrant 3. Quadrant 3 is between 180 and 270. So here's 240. you got to find the reference angle. This is 180, and this is 240. We said the reference angle is between the hypotenuse and the x-axis, so that's about 60 degrees. So what we're really looking for is sine of 60. Now keep in mind, in quadrant 3, sine is negative, because y is negative there, because you're going down. Anytime you're going down, y is negative. So this is the same as negative sine 60. <coughs> so we know sine 60, which is this angle, is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. So 
it's root 3 over 2, but we're going to add a negative sign because sine is negative in quadrant 3. And that's our answer, negative root 3 over 2. So let's go over some more examples. Now let's say if we want to figure out what cosine 5 pi over 6 is. So let's convert 5 pi over 6 to uh, degrees. So we're going to multiply by 180 over pi. So the pi's cancel. 18 over 6 is 3, so 180 over 6 is 30. And thus we have 30 times 5, which is 150. So we're looking for a cosine of 150. Now before we evaluate that, let's find a reference angle. 150 is somewhere over here. And this is 180. So the angle inside the triangle is 30 degrees. Now cosine in quadrant 2 is negative because cosine represents x and as you go to the left x is negative. So therefore this is the same as negative cosine of the reference angle 30. So I'm drawing our 30, 60 degree, 90 triangle. We know across the 30 is 1, across the 60 is root 3, across the 90 is 2. So cosine 30 is adjacent over hypotenuse, so we get negative root 3 over 2. So now let's say if you want to find tangent of 5 pi over 3. So let's convert it to degrees. 5 pi over 3 times 180 over pi. Cancel the pi's. 180 over 3 is 60, and 60 times 5, well 6 times 5 is 30, add to 0, you get 300. So let's find a reference angle. 300 is from here to here. And we know this is 360. So the angle inside is the difference between 360 and 300, so it's 60. Now tangent in quadrant 4, tangent is y over x. x is positive in quadrant 4 because you're going to the right. But y is negative because you're going down. So tangent, which is y over x, is going to be a negative value. So tan 5 pi over 3, which is tan of 300, which is negative tangent of the reference angle, 60. So now that we have the reference angle, we can use the 30, 60, 90 triangle to evaluate it. So across the 30 is 1, across the 60 is root 3, across the 90 is 2. So tangent of 60 is opposite over adjacent. So it's root 3 over 1, but negative root 3. So now let's say if we want to find out what secant of 7 pi over 6 is. Let's convert radians to degrees. So this is the same as 180 over pi. Let's cancel the pi's. 180 divided by 6 is 30. 3 times 7 is 21, so 30 times 7 is 210. So this is the same as secant 210, but secant is 1 over cosine. So this is 1 over cosine 210. Now 210 is in quadrant 3. So this is 180. This is 210, so the reference angle therefore has to be 30. So we're looking for cosine 30, but cosine is negative in quadrant 3, so we're going to add a negative sign. So using the 30, 60, 90 triangle, as you rewrite this triangle, you're going to memorize it, like, you're going to know it easily. So cosine 30 is adjacent over hypotenuse, that's root 3 over 2. And so we got to flip it because it's on the bottom. So this is the same as negative 2 over root 3 for secant. And we got to rationalize it. So let's multiply top and bottom by root 3. So you get negative 2 root 3 over 3. Now the next thing we need to go over is, um, well let's try this one, cosecant of 5 pi over 4. So let's convert that into degrees, so 180 over pi. 180 over 4, that's 45 degrees, and 45 times 5 is 225. Cosecant is 1 over sine, so we have 1 over sine 225. And 225 is in quadrant 3. If you subtract that from 180, you get a reference angle of 45. And in quadrant 3, both sine and cosine is negative. 
So here we need the 45, 45, 90 triangle. And the sides are root 2, root 2, and 2. So let's focus on this angle. So the opposite side is square root 2 divided by the hypotenuse. So sine 45 is root 2 over 2. And since we got to flip it, it's going to be negative 2 over root 2. Then we're going to have to rationalize it. So let's multiply top and bottom by root 2. So it's negative 2 root 2. The square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is the square root of 4, which is 2. So these 2's cancel, and you get negative root 2. So now we're going to go over the double angle formulas. So let's say if um, cosine is, um, like, let's say cosine theta is, hmm, 8 over 17. And theta is between 0 and pi over 2. So basically, it's in quadrant 1. So draw the triangle in quadrant 1. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. This is the 8, 15, 17 triangle. So the missing side is 15. Everything is positive in quadrant 1. Now we want to find sine 2 theta, cosine 2 theta, and tangent 2 theta. Let's find the double angle, sine 2 theta first. Sine 2 theta, the equation is 2 sine theta, cosine theta. So you already know what cosine is. You can replace the entire cosine with 8 over 17. And sine of this angle is opposite over hypotenuse. So it's 15 over 17 times 2. 2 times 15 is 30. So 30 times 8, 3 times 8 is 24, add the 0, that's 240. 17 times 17 is 289. So that's the answer for, um, actually let me put that number somewhere else, because I need as much space as possible. So the answer is 240 over 289 for sine 2 theta. For cosine 2 theta, I'm going to use this form. 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. So cosine is 8 over 17 squared minus 1. But instead of writing minus 1, I'm going to get the common denominator. 17 squared is 289. So it's going to be 289 over 289. 8 squared is 64 times 2, which is 128. So we have 128 over 289 minus 289 over 289. So 128 minus 289. If my math is correct, I got negative 161 over 289. Now, if you want to find tangent to theta, you can use the formula, or you can simply divide sine 2 theta over cosine 2 theta. Now, sine 2 theta, we got 240 over 289. And cosine 2 theta was negative 161 over 289. Notice that the 289s cancel. So tan 2 theta, all it is is just 240 over negative 161. That's the quick way to find it. Now we need to go back to the unit circle because it's something that I forgot to mention, but now that I remember it, it will be wise to go over. So at zero degrees, this point is one comma zero. This point is zero comma one. And this point is um, negative one zero. And this is zero negative one. Because to evaluate these functions at those points, um, You have to just, you can't use the 30, 60, 90, or the 45, 45, 90 triangle. So let's say if you want to figure out what sine 90 is. Sine 90 is over here. And you need the y value. It's equal to 1. Cosine of 90, or cosine pi over 2, which is the same as 90, is the x value. It's 0. So let's say if you want to find secant of pi. Secant of pi is 1 over cosine pi. And pi is over here, which represents 180. So cosine pi is the x value. So it's 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1. But now let's say if you want to find um, tangent of 3 pi over 2. Tangent is sine over cosine, which is y over x. So it's negative 1 divided by 0. Whenever you have a 0 on the bottom, it's undefined. So tangent at 
3 pi over 2 and at pi over 2 is undefined. Now let's say if you want to find cotangent of pi over 2, which is 90. Cotangent is cosine the x value divided by sine. So it's 0 over 1, so that's just 0. So whenever you get these points 0, pi over 2, pi which is 180, or 3 pi over 2, which is 270, um, you just have to know these points. You can't use the 30, 60, 90 triangle to evaluate those points. Now another question that you may get is, before we go over the half angle, let's say if they give you a point. Let's say you have the point 5, comma 12. But let's say uh, negative 12 instead. And they want you to find the six trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, tangent, and so forth. What you want to do is draw the point. So x is positive 5. We've got to go 5 to the right. And y is negative 12, so we've got to go down 12. Draw your triangle. So here it's positive 5, negative 12. This is the 5, 12, 13 triangle. So if you want to find sine, we pretty much covered this already, but the problem is presented in a different way. So sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. That's negative 12 over 13. Cosine theta is um, adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's 5 over 13. And tangent theta is opposite over adjacent, so that's negative 12 over 5. Cosecant theta is a reciprocal of sine, so that's negative 13 over 12. And secant is the reciprocal of cosine, which is 13 over 5. And cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, negative 5 over 12. So I just want to go over that point, even though we covered this concept already. If you, if you um, get an x, y coordinate, you can find any of these six trig functions from that. Just draw the triangle in the appropriate quadrant. So now let's go back to, let's work on half angles. So let's say that, um, let's say tangent is negative 3 over 5. And theta is between pi over 2 and uh, pi. You want to find out the half angle, sine theta over 2, cosine theta over 2, and tangent theta over 2. So first, let's draw the triangle. Theta is in quadrant 2. It's between 90 and 180. And tangent is opposite over adjacent. Opposite to theta is positive 3 because y is going up. And it's adjacent is negative 5 because x is going to the left. Actually, hold on, i got to fix that. That doesn't work. Well, actually, it could work. It's just not. I, will, I wanted it to be a 3, 4, 5 triangle. But in this case, it's not a 3, 4, 5 triangle. Because the 5 is not the hypotenuse. But that's okay. We can still work with this. Let's find the hypotenuse. So we have to use a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's not a common triangle. 3 squared is 9. 5 squared is 25. 25 plus 9 is 34. So this is the square root of 34. I should have made this 4, but sometimes you got to solve it when it's not a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So now that we have that, let's calculate sine theta over 2. The equation is it's plus or minus square root 1 minus cosine x divided by 2. So that's going to be the square root 1 minus cosine we know is adjacent, which is negative 5 over hypotenuse. So that's negative 5 over root 34 all divided by 2. So what I'm going to do to simplify this equation, I'm going to multiply top and bottom by this denominator, root 34. So it's going to be root 34, the two negatives become positive, plus 5 over square 2 root 34. And we really can't simplify that. but I want to get nice numbers, so I'm going to create a new equation. Let's say tangent theta is negative 3 over 4. This is what I wanted. And theta is between 
pi over 2 and pi. But at least now you know how to solve for triangles that uh, don't involve common numbers, like 3, 4, 5, and so forth. So in quadrant 2, x is negative and y is positive. The opposite side is 3. The adjacent side is 4, but negative, because it's going to the left. And the hypotenuse this time is 5. OK, so now let's find sine theta over 2. So using the equation, we said it's 1 square root 1 minus cosine over 2. So it's 1 minus cosine theta is adjacent negative 4 over 5. Now we're going to multiply the inside of the radical, top and bottom, by the denominator 5, just like we did before. The two negatives will become a positive. So if we distribute the 5, 5 times 1 is going to be 5. And 5 times 4 over 5 is just 4. So we get rid of the fractions. And over here, 5 times 2 is 10. So what we get is the square root of 9 over 10. The square root of 9 is 3. So we have 3 over root 10. And then we're going to rationalize it. We're going to multiply top and bottom by root 10. So we're going to get 3 root 10 over 10. So that's the answer. But notice that it can be positive or negative. Now, let's look at this. Theta is between 90 and 180. So theta over 2, if we divide each of those by 2, it's between pi over 2 and pi over 4. So pi over 4 is 45, pi over 2 is 90. That means the half angle is in quadrant 1 if the angle theta is in quadrant 2. So in quadrant 1, everything is positive. So between these two signs, we're going to pick the positive one. So that's what you got to do if you have to choose between positive and negative. You got to find out where which quadrant is theta over 2 located. Now, we're going to find cosine theta over 2. The equation for cosine theta over 2 is very similar to sine theta over 2. Instead of being 1 minus cosine, it's 1 plus cosine um, over 2. So it's going to be 1 plus cosine, we said it's negative 4 over 5, divided by 2. So once again, we're going to multiply the inside of the radical, top and bottom, by 5. So we're going to get 5, but instead of plus 4, 5 minus 4. 5 times 1 is 5, 5 times 4 fifths is 4 over 10. So this is going to be 1 over 10. The square root of 1 is 1, so this is 1 root 10. And if we rationalize it, we get radical 10 over 10. And it's still going to be positive because theta over 2 is in quadrant 1. So that's the answer for cosine. Now to find tangent theta over 2, just like we did before for tangent 2 theta, we're going to divide sine by cosine. So sine is 3 root 10 over 10. And cosine is root 10 over 10. There's like a 1 in front. Notice that the 10s cancel and the root 10s cancel. So 3 over 1 is just 3. And that's how you can find tangent theta over 2. Once you get sine and cosine, just divide them. OK, so that's it for that topic. So let's move on to our next topic. Let's calculate sine of 75 degrees. Now there are some calculators like the Casio FX 115 ES which you can find at Walmart. If you type this in you're going to get the exact answer in radical form too. Exact value. But let's use the equation to figure this out. So we're going to use um, this one sine alpha plus beta is equal to sine alpha cosine beta plus cosine alpha sine beta. I believe that's the equation. I'm just going by memory here, but you know which equation I'm talking about if you have taken trig. So we need two angles that add up to 70, 5. In this case, 45 and 30. So this is the same as sine 45 plus 30. The 45 is alpha, 30 is beta. So this is sine 45 cosine 30 plus cosine 45 sine 30. Now, you can use the triangles to evaluate this. Sine 45 is going to be root 2 over 2. You can also just go to Google Images, type in unit circle, and you can answer these questions based on that. Remember, sine is the y value. Cosine 30 is um, 
root 3 over 2. Cosine 45 is root 2 over 2. And sine 30 is 1 half. So root 2 times root 3 is root 6. And um, 2 times 2 is 4. And root 2 times 1 is just root 2 over 4. And then you can combine it uh, as a single fraction. So if you get that Casio FX115ES, the silver calculator, it'll give you this exact answer. Now let's say if you want to figure out what, um, what's the other one, cosine 165. The equation for cosine, alpha plus beta, it's cosine alpha, cosine beta. You switch positive to negative, and then it's sine alpha, sine beta. So 165, what two angles that are on a unit circle adds up to 165? So we're going to choose 120, which is on a unit circle, and 45. Now keep in mind, the reference angle of 120, 180 minus 120 is 60. So here we have cosine 120 times cosine 45 minus sine 120, sine 45. So let's use our triangles to solve this one. So for the 45, 45, 90 triangle, this is root 2, that's root 2, and that's 2. And for the 30, 60, 90 triangle, across the 30 is 1, across the 60 is root 3, across the 90 is 2. So cosine 120, we said the reference angle is 60. For cosine, it's adjacent, which is 1, over hypotenuse. So cosine 120 is 1 half. But 120 is in quadrant 2, and cosine is negative in quadrant 2, because x is negative as you go to the left. Cosine 45, that's just root 2 over 2. There's no other way to solve that. I mean, that's just what it is. Sine 45 is going to be the same thing, root 2 over 2. Sine 120, that's going to be opposite over hypotenuse. And sine is positive in quadrant 2. So it's positive root 3 over 2. So here we're going to get negative root 2 over 4 minus root 6 over 4. So the answer is just negative root 2 minus root 6 over 4. If we combine it into a single fraction. Now sometimes you might get the uh, double angle, I mean the alpha plus beta problem in reverse. Let's say if you get this question, sine 50, cosine 10, plus cosine 50, sine 10. You need to recognize the equation, sine alpha, cosine beta, plus cosine alpha, sine beta is sine alpha plus beta. Now notice that if it's positive, this stays positive. For cosine, it's the reverse. If that's positive, it switches to negative. But notice that it's alpha plus beta. That's the important part. So all we're going to do is add these two angles, 10 and 50. So alpha is 50, 10 is beta, so 50 plus 10 is 60. This entire expression is equal to sine 60. And using the uh, triangle, we know sine 60 is root 3 over 2. Keep in mind, you have to solve it this way. Sine 50, I mean, it's not on a unit circle, so you can't get an exact answer for that. So you, you have to do it this way. So now let's work on solving equations. So let's say if 2 cosine x plus 1 is equal to 0. Let's solve for cosine. So let's move the 1 to the other side. It's going to be negative 1, and then let's divide by 2. So cosine is negative 1 half. Now, if we use the 30, 60, 90 triangle, we know across the 1 is, across 30 is 1, across 60 is root 3, across 90 is 2. So, adjacent to 1 is 60. So we know that the reference angle is 60. Cosine 60 is 1 half. It's not negative 1 half, but 1 half. So, cosine is negative in what quadrants? Cosine is negative in quadrants 2 and in quadrant 3. In quadrant 2, from here to here, that's about 120. So cosine 120 is negative a half. And from the positive x-axis to here, this is 60 more than 80, so that's 240. Cosine 240 is also negative a half. So x, therefore, is equal to these two angles. Let's say if the answer 
let's say if you want to find a solution between 0 and 2 pi, you have to convert 120 to radians. So you can do 120 times pi over 180, cancel the zeros. So that's 12 pi over 18. If you divide by 6, you get 2 pi over 3, if you divide top and bottom by 6. So 120 is the same as 2 pi over 3. 240, which is twice 120, is the same as 4 pi over 3. So that's the answer for this problem. Now sometimes you may get the exact same question, and they may want you to find um, all solutions. Let's say if this restriction was given to you. Your answer would therefore be like 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi n, where n is 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2. And your other answer is 2 pi over 3, I mean 4 pi over 3. Let me fix that. The other answer is 4 pi over 3 plus 2 pi n, if you want to write a general equation. So let's try another one. Let's say if sine squared minus cosine squared is equal to 0. <coughs> By the way, for each of these examples, feel free to pause the video and see if you could try yourself. So let's move the cosine squared to the other side. And then let's divide both sides by cosine squared. Sine squared over cosine squared is tangent squared. And cosine squared over cosine squared is 1. So when does tangent equal 1? Tangent is 1 um, when y and x are the same, which occurs um, for the 45, 45, 90 triangle. So tangent of 45 is opposite over adjacent. Root 2 over 2 is 1. So the reference angle is 45. Once you find a reference angle, you could solve it. If we take the square root of both sides, tan x is equal to plus or minus 1. So because it's positive and negative, we need the answer in all four quadrants. So therefore, in quadrant 1, it's the reference angle 45. In quadrant 2, it's 135. That's 180 minus 45. In quadrant 3, it's 180 plus 45. That's 225. In quadrant 4, it's 360 minus 45. So that's 315. In radians, it's pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4s. All of the pi over 4s have the same reference angle, which is pi over 4. Now, that would be the answer if they want it between 0 and 2 pi. Now, let's say if they, you, the question wants to find all solutions and there's no restriction. Then you got to add, you got to write a general equation. Now, you can say pi over 4 plus 2 pi n, 3 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n, 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n. You can just say each answer plus 2 pi n. Some teachers will keep it simple. Others, they want you to write one simplified equation or maybe two. It turns out that you can write one equation that would explain the, this pattern of numbers that you see. Notice that each number, there's a common difference. This one, it increases by 2 pi over 4 each time. So all you need is the first one, pi over 4 plus 2 pi over 4 times n, which is the same as pi over 4 plus pi over 2 times n. And then make sure you define what n is, which is 0 plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and so forth. You see, pi over 4 plus 2 pi over 4 gives you 3 pi over 4, when n is 1. When n is 2, pi over 4 plus 4 pi over 4 gives you 5 pi over 4. So this one equation explains the entire pattern. Um, you can always simplify it if you realize there's a common difference between successive answers. Okay, so let's try another example. Let's say if we want to solve this equation. 2 sine squared plus 3 sine x plus 1 equals 0. So feel free to pause the video and give this one a shot. So we got to factor it. Now for this one, we can factor it by trial and error because it's, it's very straightforward. So what two numbers will multiply? What two numbers do you have to multiply to get 2 sine squared? There's no other choice. It's 2 sine x sine x. And two numbers that multiply to 1 is 1 and 1. It could be negative 1 and negative 1, but notice that we have a positive 3 here, so it has to be plus 1. That's how you can factor real quick, but let's say if you want to have a systematic way of factoring such trinomials, you can replace sine with a. Now what you got to do is multiply the first and the last coefficient. 2 times 1 is 2. 
then you need two numbers that multiply to 2 but add to the middle term, which was supposed to be 3. 2 times 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3. Next, replace the middle term, the 3a, with these two, 2a plus 1a. Notice that 2a and 1a adds up to 3a. And then factor by grouping. In the first two terms, take out the GCF, which is 2a, and then you're left with a plus 1. In the last term, take out a 1, and then you have a plus 1. If these two are the same, then you're on the right track. We're going to write that once, a plus 1, and then these two is going to be in the next parentheses, 2a plus 1 equals 0. Notice that looks the same as this. So in case you see harder examples, now you know how to factor that expression if needed. So we're going to set each expression equal to 0. And we're going to solve for sine. So here, sine x is equal to negative 1 half. And here I already moved the 1 to, across, so sine x is equal to negative 1. Now, for the second one, sine is negative 1 at pi over 2, or 90 no, not at pi over 2, at 3 pi over 2, 270 degrees. So that's something you have to know, based on a unit circle. Sine is negative 1 half at, let's see, if we do the 30, 60, 90 triangle, this is 1, root 3, 2. S opposite to the 1 is the 30, so the reference angle is 30. Sine is negative in quadrants 3 and 4. So in quadrants 3, if the reference angle is 30, the angle is 180 plus 30, which is 270, or 7 pi over 6. Sine is also negative in quadrant 4. And the angle is going to be 360 minus the reference angle. So 360 minus 30 is 330. And if you convert 330 into radians, it's um, multiply by pi over 180, cancel the zeros. And then you can divide everything by 3. 33 over 3 is 11, and 18 over 3 is 6. So the other answer is 11 pi over 6. So that's the answer um, if it's between 0 and 2 pi. If we want to find all solutions for this example, um, it's going to be 7 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, 11 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, and 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. There's no common difference between successive answers. If these two answers don't differ by 180, if there's two answers, or if they don't differ by 90, if there's four answers, um, it's not going to work. Just add 2 pi n to each answer. Now let's say if we have a multiple angle problem. Let's say if sine 2x is equal to root 3 over 2. Let's say that theta is 2x. So sine theta is root 3 over 2. We know that sine 60, or pi over 3, is root 3 over 2. And also, um, sine is positive in quadrant 2. 2 pi over 3 is also root 3 over 2, which is 120. So we have 60 and 120. But now, now that we get those answers, what do we do with the 2x now? Now let's say if we want to find a solution between 0 and 2 pi. For these problems, it's easier if you just write the general equation and then plug in numbers to get the solutions that is between 0 and 2 pi. So to find the first answer, replace theta with what we substituted in the beginning, 2x. So we're going to set 2x equal to pi over 3 plus 2 pi n to find for all other answers. And we're also going to set 2x equal to pi over 3 plus the other answer, 2 pi plus, I meant 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. <laughs> yeah, this was the other answer. So now what we're going to do is solve for x, divide everything by 2. So pi over 3, if you divide it by 2, basically you need to multiply the denominator by 2. Dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 1 half, so it becomes pi over 6. And 2 pi over 2 is just pi, so plus pi n. And here this becomes 2 pi over 6, which is reduces to pi over 3, plus pi n. So that's the general equation. Now, notice that there's a 2 in front of the x. If you see a 2 here, plug in two numbers for n. In this case, 0 and 1. If we had a 3x, we're going to plug in three numbers, so 0, 1, and 2. If there was a 4x, we're going to plug in 0, 1, 2, and 3. 
So if we plug in 0 into the first equation, we get pi over 6. If we plug in 0 into this equation for n, we get pi over 3. Now if we plug in 1, pi over 6 plus pi, if we get common denominators, pi is the same as 6 pi over 6. So 1 pi over 6 plus 6 pi over 6 is 7 pi over 6. If we plug in 1 for here, um, pi over 3 plus pi is the same as pi over 3 plus 3 pi over 3, which is 4 pi over 3. Now if we plug in 2 for n, that's pi over 3 plus 2 pi, which is 7 pi over 3. Notice that it's above the 2 pi limit. That's why you don't want to plug in 2 for n. So when, if you see a 2 in front of x, only plug in 2 numbers for n, 0 and 1. So these are the four answers that are in this interval. So let's try another problem like this. Let's say if uh, cosine, if we have cosine 3x is equal to 1 half. So we're going to say theta is equal to 3x. So cosine theta is 1 half. Cosine of what angles is 1 half? Cosine is positive in quadrants 1 and 4. The reference angle is 60. Cosine 60 is 1 half. And 60 is the same as pi over 3. And in quadrant 4, it's 5 pi over 3, or 300. So we're going to set 3x. That does not look like a 3. We're going to set 3x equal to pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. And we're going to set it equal to the other answer, 5 pi over 3 plus 2 pi n. So now let's divide both sides by 3. So we get pi over 9 plus 2 pi over 3 times n. But 2 pi over 3, I'm going to try to get common denominators. That's the same as if we multiply 3, 2 pi over 3 times 3 over 3, you get 6 pi n over 9. And here, this is going to be 5 pi over 9 plus, well, it's 2 pi over 3 again, which is 6 pi over 9. It makes it easier to add once you have common denominators. So now, because we have a 3 in front of the x, we're going to plug in three numbers for n, 0, 1, and 2, if we want our answers between 0 and 2 pi. So the first answer, if we plug in 0, it's just going to be what we see here. That's pi over 9. The next answer, if we plug in 0 here, it's going to be 5 pi over 9. Now, we're going to plug in 1 for n. So 1 pi over 9 plus 6 pi over 9, 1 plus 6 is 7. See, so it makes it easier to find the answers. 7 pi over 9. Here, 5 plus 6 is 11 pi over 9, when n is 1. Now, if we plug in 2 for n, 2 times 6 is 12, plus 1, which is 13, so we get 13 pi over 9. If we plug in 2 for n here, 2 times 6 is 12, plus 5, we get 17 pi over 9. 17 over 9 is less than 2, because 18 over 9 is 2. So we're still within the range. So notice that we started with two answers, but because there's a 3x, we got to multiply that by 3. So instead of getting the two answers that we see here, we actually get a total of six answers. In the last example, where we had 2x, we had two answers, but it doubled to four answers. So hopefully you see the pattern at this point. So that's what you're going to see for your trig finder when you're, when you're studying for, um, when you got to solve for x. Sometimes I'm at a loss for words. All right, so now we're going to do a few problems involving verifying trig identities. Actually, before we do that, let's go over, like, inverse stuff. Let's say if you want to find the inverse sine of radical 3 over 2. We know that sine 60 is root 3 over 2. But now, something you have to keep in mind. I want to make a distinction. Let's say if you have a problem that looks like this, sine theta equals 3 over 2. There's two answers. Sine is positive in quadrants 1 and 2. So that's 60 degrees and 120. Inverse sine of root 3 over 2 is 60. However, it is not 120. And you might be wondering, well, why is that? Sine 120 is root 3 over 2, but inverse sine of root 3 over 2 can't be 120. The reason being is arc sine or inverse sine, which is the same, has a restricted domain. Inverse sine exists between quadrants 1 and 4. 
and the same is true for inverse tangent. And the angle has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So let's say if your answer was 300. 300 will be in quadrant 4. However, it's not in the range of negative 90 and 90, so you can't use 300. Your answer has to be between those two numbers. 60 is between negative 90 and 90, so 60 works. That's the answer. Now, keep in mind, inverse cosine exists between uh, quadrant 1 and 2, between 0 and 180, or 0 and pi. So when you, whenever you're dealing with inverse sine or inverse cosine, just remember, it's restricted. For inverse cosine, your answer has to be between 0 and 180. For inverse sine, it has to be between uh, negative 90 and 90. So let's say if you want to figure out inverse sine of negative 1 half. That's quadrants. Sine is negative in quadrant 3 and 4. And we know sine 30 is 1 half, so the reference angle is 30. So sine 210 is negative 1 half. Sine 330 is negative 1 half. But also sine negative 30, which is the negative coterminal angle of 330. If you do 330 minus 360, you get negative 30. It is also negative 1 half. But not all of these answers are in the domain of inverse sine. Inverse sine exists between negative 90 and 90. So which answer is between negative 90 and 90? It's this one, negative 30. So that's the answer. It's negative 30 or negative pi over 6. So let's say if you want to find the inverse cosine of negative root 2 over 2. The reference angle for that is 45. But in quadrant 2, 45 is the same as 135. If you do 180 minus, 1, minus 45. And that's 3 pi over 4. Now let's say if you want to find inverse tangent of root 3. Let's say negative root 3. So that's quadrant 4. Tangent of 60 is root 3. So you need negative 60 or negative pi over 3. So just know the restrictions for arc sine and arc tangent and so forth. So to figure this out, make sure you know your unit circle. Or if you use the 30, 60, 90 triangle, you can also get the answer too. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so you want to find out what angle is opposite to root 3. That's the 60. Tangent is opposite root 3 over 1. And that's how we got a reference angle of 60. But because it's negative in quadrant 4, we need negative 60 and not 300. So I just want to briefly review arc tan, arc sine, and arc cosine. Okay, so now let's work on verifying identity problems. Let's say if you have this, cosine x plus sine x tangent x. Let's say if that's equal to secant x. Prove that the left side is the same as the right side. So what we're going to do first is convert to sine and cosine. Tangent is sine x over cosine x. Now notice that we have two terms on the left. This is one term, that's one term. And we only have one term on the right. Whenever you want to go from 2 to 1, you want to get common denominators. So we're going to multiply this side by cosine over cosine. So what we have here is cosine squared plus sine squared um, divided by cosine, which we can put in one fraction now. Cosine squared plus sine squared, that's an identity, is 1. That's something you have to know. So 1 over cosine is secant x. So secant equals secant. It's been proven. So now let's say if we have this problem, cotangent cubed over cosecant x. To improve your skill on verifying identities, this is something you just have to practice. If I was you, just go to your trick textbook and just do maybe 20, 30, or 40 problems until you feel comfortable with this material. So feel free to pause the video and give this problem a shot. How would you do this one? So let's convert everything into sine and cosine. Cotangent is cosine over sine. But because it's cubed, it's going to be cosine cubed divided by sine cubed. Cosecant is 1 over sine. So now what we're going to do is multiply top and bottom by sine cubed, just to simplify the expression. So cosine cubed over sine cubed times sine cubed, uh, these cancel. And so we get just cosine cubed. 
and only one of these cancels, so we get sine squared. Now, what I'm going to do is separate one of the cosines because I see a cosine on the outside here. So I'm going to have cosine x times cosine squared over sine squared. Now, notice that cosine over sine is cotangent. So I'm going to convert that back into cotangent. Actually, no, I'm going to do something different instead of that. I'm going to convert cosine squared into 1 minus sine squared, because cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. And then I'm going to separate into two fractions. So this one fraction is 1 over sine squared, and the other fraction is sine squared over sine squared. Now, 1 over sine squared is cosecant squared. And sine squared over sine squared is 1, so we get the answer. Now, there's something else that we could have done, too. We could have made it cotangent squared. Because you need to know that 1 plus cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared. Therefore, cotangent squared is cosecant squared minus 1 if you rearrange this equation. So that's another way that it could be done, but I wanted to show you both ways. So now let's say if you have cosecant squared x over cotangent x, and let's say if it's equal to cosecant x, secant x. So let's convert uh, cosecant and cotangent into sine and cosine. So this is 1 over sine squared, and cotangent is cosine over sine. So let's simplify it by multiplying top and bottom by sine squared. So on top, we just get a 1. On the bottom, we get cosine. Well, one of the signs cancel, so we just get cosine uh, times sine. And now we can split it as 1 over cosine times 1 over sine. 1 over cosine is secant x, and 1 over sine is cosecant x, which is what we have here. So let's say if you have this one, tangent pi over 2 minus x secant x is equal to cosecant x. So you need to know your even and odd functions. Cosine negative x is an even function. It's just equal to cosine x. Sine negative x is an odd function. It's equal to negative sine x. Tangent is also odd. Actually, not this one. We need the, the other one, the complementary stuff. Also, sine pi over 2 minus x is cosine x. The, this is the co-function identity. That's the one we need. But it's good to know your even and odd functions. Cosine 90 minus x is sine x. Whenever the two angles add up to 90, cosine and sine are equal. For example, sine 30 is equal to cosine 60, because 30 plus 60 is 90. Sine 30 is 1 half, cosine 60 is 1 half. Sine 0 is equal to cosine 90, because 0 plus 90 is 90. Sine 45 is equal to cosine 45. See a pattern? So sine 20, for example, is equal to cosine of what angle? It has to be cosine 70, because the two angles add up to 90. Tangent of 90 minus x is equal to its co-function, which is cotangent x. The co-function of sine, guess what it is? Cosine. The co-function of secant is cosecant, and the co-function of tangent is cotangent. So they call it co-function identities. So we can replace tangent 90 minus x with cotan x. All of that just for that simple uh, replacement. Now let's replace cotan x with cosine over sine. And secant, we're going to replace it with 1 over cosine. So the cosines cancel. 1 over sine is cosecant, which equals that. So now let's go over this one. Let's say if you have sine x over 1 minus cosine x. 
and you want to prove that it's equal to 1 plus cosine x over sine. If you see like a 1 minus cosine, a 1 plus cosine, 1 minus sine on the bottom, multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. The conjugate is just, instead of 1 minus cosine, it's a 1 plus cosine. You change the minus sign into a plus sign. So in the numerator, what we have is sine x times 1 plus cosine x. And on the bottom, if we FOIL 1 plus cosine times 1 minus cosine, you should get 1 minus cosine squared. Now keep in mind, to FOIL it, just to review, it's 1 times 1, which is 1. 1 times negative cosine. Cosine times 1. So cosine plus negative cosine, they cancel. And then cosine times negative cosine, which is negative cosine squared. So now we're going to convert 1 minus cosine squared into uh, sine squared because sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. And then we can cancel one of the sines. And now we have the answer. 1 plus cosine over sine. See, that wasn't that bad, was it? OK, let's try a double angle um, formula. Prove that sine 2x is equal to 2 sine x cosine x. How would you do that? You know the double angle formula, but how would you prove it? The best way to do this is to use the alpha plus beta formula. Sine alpha plus beta is sine alpha cosine beta plus cosine alpha sine beta. So alpha is going to be x and beta is going to be x. x plus x is 2x, right? So we have sine x cosine x plus cosine x sine x. Notice that these two terms are similar. There's a 1 here and there's a 1 there. 1 plus 1 is 2. So you get 2 sine x cosine x. So that's how you verify that identity. Now what about this one? Let's say if you have cosine to the fourth minus sine to the fourth. And that's equal to cosine 2x. Now usually for these problems, it might be better to start from the right side, but we'll start from the left side. Let's say if you have to factor x squared minus 25, it's x plus 5, x minus 5, right? Difference of perfect squares. Where cosine to the fourth minus sine to the fourth, it's cosine squared plus sine squared, and then cosine squared minus sine squared. Cosine squared plus sine squared is 1. And cosine squared minus sine squared is an identity. So you can just say, hey, that's cosine 2x. Cosine 2x has three forms. This is one of them, which you should memorize. The other one is 2 cosine squared minus 1. And the other one is uh, 1 minus 2 sine squared. Now, we talked about this one earlier in the video. So let's change this one into that form, just in case if you haven't seen that form before. So 2 cosine squared minus 1 is the same as cosine squared plus cosine squared minus 1, right? Cosine squared plus cosine squared is 2 cosine squared. Now, 1 sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So I'm only going to replace one of these with 1 minus sine squared. Notice that the 1's cancel. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. So I have negative sine squared plus cosine squared, which you can reverse them as cosine squared minus sine squared, which is cosine 2x. Now, what about this one? Sine x plus cosine x squared is equal to 1 plus sine 2x. Let's FOIL. So we're going to rewrite this as sine, well, sine x plus cosine x times sine x plus cosine x. So sine times sine is sine squared sine times cosine is sine cosine cosine times sine is sine cosine and cosine times cosine is cosine squared sine squared plus cosine squared is 1 it's an identity and these two are like terms so 1 plus 1 is 2 so we get 2 sine x cosine x and we know that's a double angle identity so 2 sine x cosine x is sine 2x and thus the left side now equals the right side. 
So that's just a warm up on verifying identities. Make sure you get more practice. Um, and just make sure you know your double angle formulas, your half angle formulas, the alpha plus beta stuff. And you may need to know like the product to sum, sum to product. Basically all the formulas that are in your trig test, just make sure you write it down and know them. Don't depend on the formula sheet. Because you'll be spending time searching for the right equation and then all of a sudden your exam is up, your time is up, and you didn't finish your exam and that's a problem. So if you know your formulas, you can save a lot of time and you can finish it in no time. So now let's focus on like graphing and stuff like that. So let's say if y is equal to 3 sine 1 half x plus 4. How can we graph this sine wave? Make sure you know that positive sine looks like this. Negative sine looks like that. The general equation for this is a sine bx plus c plus d. a is the amplitude. Um, b helps you to find a period. If there's a c value, there's a phase shift, but c doesn't equal the phase shift, x is. And d is the vertical shift. So let's make a graph. I need more space at the top. So let's start with the vertical shift, which is 4. This is going to be our center point. So the graph has shifted up 4 units. Now the amplitude is 3. So from the uh, center point, or the, the center line, we're going to go up 3 and down 3. So our center is at 4, the max is at 7, and the minimum is at 1. So that's the amplitude, the distance between the center line and the maximum or the minimum. Now the next thing we need to find is the period. The period is 2 pi over b. b is the number in front of x, so it's 2 pi divided by a half. 2 pi over a half is the same as 2 pi times 2, which is 4 pi. Now there's no phase shift, so the graph starts at, the, at 0. And add one period to it, so it's 4 pi and then break it up into four intervals. The midpoint between 0 and 4 pi is 2 pi. The midpoint between 0 and 2 pi is 1 pi. And if you times that by 3, you get this point, which is 3 pi. So sine starts at the center. Because it's positive sine, it's going to go up before it goes down. And then it's back to the middle, then to its lowest value at 1, and then back to the middle. That's how you can draw one sine wave, one cycle. And if you wish to continue it, you just follow the pattern. Add another 4 pi, so this would be 8 pi. This would be uh, 6 pi, 7 pi, and 5 pi, if you want to continue the wave. But we're just going to focus on drawing one cycle. So now let's say if we have this function. y is equal to 2 cosine x minus pi over 2 minus 3. Cosine starts like this. It starts at the top. Negative cosine starts at the bottom. Cosine starts like this. Sine, negative cosine starts like that. If you just want to draw one cycle. Okay. So let's make our graph. This time, the bulk of the graph is going to be at the bottom because the vertical shift is at negative 3. So that's our midline. The amplitude is 2. So we need to go up 2 to negative 1 and down 2 to negative 5. Now, let's calculate the period. The period is 2 pi over b. And the number in front of x is 1, so b is 1, so the period is just 2 pi. However, because we have a c value, we do have a phase shift. To find the phase shift, set the inside equal to 0 and solve for x. So x is equal to pi over 2. So that's where the graph starts. And then add a period to that. Pi over 2 plus 2 pi. 2 pi is the same as 4 pi over 2. So you get 5 pi over 2. So that's where the cycle ends. And then you want to break it into 4 intervals. So the midpoint between 1 and 5 is 3. The midpoint between 3 and 5 is 4. 4 pi over 2 is the same as 2 pi. And between 1 and 3 is 2. 2 pi over 2 is the same as pi.
Now, cosine, positive cosine starts at the top. But remember, we've got to start at pi over 2 because of the phase shift. The graph has been shifted horizontally to the right by 90 degrees, so we're pi over 2. The cosine starts at the top, then it goes back to the middle, then to the bottom, back to the middle, and then to the top. Now, avoid drawing a V-shape. Make sure you draw like a sine wave. So that's how you draw one cycle of cosine. So let's say if you want to graph y is equal to negative 2 sine 1 third x minus pi plus 5. So the bulk of the graph is going to be at the top at 5. So that's the vertical shift. The amplitude is 2, so we need to go up 2 and down 2. So next, let's calculate the period. It's 2 pi over b, or 2 pi divided by the number in front of x, which is 1 third, which is 2 pi times 3, that's 6 pi. And then let's calculate the uh, phase shift. Set the inside equal to 0. So 1 third x is equal to pi. Multiply both sides by 3. The graph starts at 3 pi. So let's say 3 pi is over here somewhere. If we add a period to it, 3 pi plus 6 pi, we get one full cycle, that's 9 pi. So the graph is going to stop at 9 pi. The midpoint between 3 and 9, if you add them up, divide by 2, 3 plus 9 is 12. 12 divided by 2 is 6. 6 pi. The midpoint between 3 and 6, you add them, 3 plus 6 is 9, divided by 2, it's 9 pi over 2. The midpoint between 6 and 9, is add them up 15 and divide it by 2, so 15 pi over 2. Now sine starts at the center. The phase shift is 3 pi, so we're going to start at the midline, but at 3 pi. Negative sine, instead of going up, it goes down first to the minimum, which is at 3, back to the middle, up to 7, and then back to the middle. So that's our one cycle sine wave. Now let's say if you want to graph negative 3 secant 2x plus 4. Secant is 1 over cosine. So if you want to graph secant, graph cosine first. So the majority of the graph is going to be at the top. So the vertical shift is at 4. Amplitude is 3, so up 3, down 3. So 4 plus 3 is 7, 4 minus 3 is 1. And the period is 2 pi over b, which is 2 pi over 2, which is pi. So let's say pi is over here, and this is 0. Now, there's no phase shift, so it starts at 0. And since secant is 1 over cosine, we have a negative in front. Cosine starts at the bottom. Positive cosine starts at the top, and negative cosine starts at the bottom. But we need to break into four intervals. So this is going to be pi over 2, and half of pi over 2 is pi over 4. Multiply that by 3, you get 3 pi over 4. So cosine starts at the bottom, it goes to the middle, and then it goes to the top, it goes back to the middle, and down. But remember, we want to draw secant, not cosine, so we're going to use a dashed line instead of a solid line. Now, wherever you see it reaches the, the center line, the midpoint, and draw a vertical asymptote for the secant graph. So the other vertical asymptotes are on here. So secant is going to touch at this point and this point. So it's going to look like this. Now, if we were to stop here, we should only have half of the graph. But if you want to continue, you could have the other half. And that's your secant graph. It's the uh, purple line. You use cosine to help you graph it. So let's try another one like that. y equals 2 cosecant 1 fourth x minus 1. So the vertical shift is at negative 1. 
negative 1 plus 2. Our max is at 1, negative 1 minus 2. The minimum is at negative 3. And the period is 2 pi divided by b, which is 1 fourth. So 2 pi times 4, that's 8 pi. So let's put 8 pi over here somewhere. The midpoint is 4 pi, and half of that is 2 pi. Times it by 3, you get 6 pi. So cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. Sine starts at the center, and positive sine goes up, back to the center, down, and then back to the middle. So whenever it reaches the, um, it touches the midline, let's draw a vertical asymptote for the uh, cosecant graph. So cosecant is going to touch this point and this point. So let's draw the reciprocal of it, and let's follow the asymptotes. And that's how you graph cosecant with amplitude, period, and vertical shift. So now let's focus on tangent and cotangent. We're going to keep this uh, topic simple. All right, for tangent, you need to know that the vertical asymptotes are negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Now, the midpoint between the two vertical asymptotes is 0. And the midpoint between 0 and pi over 2 is pi over 4. And between those two points is negative pi over 4. Let's say this is 1, and this is negative 1, because the amplitude is 1. Tangent pi over 4 is 1. Tangent negative pi over 4 is negative 1. So the graph, it starts here, and eventually goes like that. That's tangent. Cotangent goes in the opposite direction, but let's graph it. Now the vertical asymptotes for t cotangent is 0, and pi. The midpoint is pi over 2, and between 0 and pi over 2 is pi over 4, and between these two points it's 3 pi over 4, 3 times pi over 4. So at pi over 2, which is the midpoint between the two vertical asymptotes, it's going to be 0. And at pi over 4, cotan pi over 4 is 1. Cotan 3 pi over 4, that's quadrant 2, it's negative 1. So this graph it starts at the top, and then it goes like that. That's cotan. But now you know how to get three points uh, for it. So now let's include amplitude, period, and so forth. Well, first, let's do this one, 2 tangent x minus 3. So the period is still pi. By the way, for sine, cosine, the period is 2 pi over b. For tan and cotan, the period is pi over b, not 2 pi over b. So the period didn't change, which means the vertical asymptotes are going to be the same for this one. Negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. The only thing that did change is the vertical shift and the amplitude. So let's plot the vertical shift, which is at negative 3. Negative 3 plus 2 is 1. Negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5. I mean, negative 1. So we have negative 1 and negative 5. Now, we know the midpoint between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 is 0. And this is going to be negative pi over 4. And this is going to be pi over 4. So at the midpoint, it's going to be at the center line, which is negative 3. And at negative pi over 4, um, it's going to be at negative 5 for tangent. Tangent goes this way. It's an increase in function. That's positive tan. Negative tangent looks like cotangent. At pi over 4, it's going to be at the maximum. Well, not the maximum, but at, at negative 1. But that's how you could find those three points, which can help you to plot this function. But we still have the same general shape. You can see the graph has been shifted down 3, and the amplitude is 2. 
So at pi over 4, instead of it increasing by 1 from the center, um, the center point, it increases by 2. Okay, let's try another one, but one dealing with cotan. So let's say if you want to graph y is equal to 3 cotangent x plus 4. So the period is still um, the period is still pi. So the vertical asymptotes will be the same, 0 and pi. This is one period, the distance between vertical asymptotes. Now the midpoint is going to be pi over 2, and here we have pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. Those are our points of interest. The vertical shift is up 4. And we need to go up 3 to 7 and down 3 to uh, 1. So at pi over 2, it's going to be at the uh, center line. At pi over 4, it's going to be down at 1. At 3 pi, of, uh, 3 pi over 4, it's up at 7. Cotangent goes like this. That's positive cotan. Negative cotan is an increasing function which I need to fix the points that I have. Cotangent goes like this, so a pi over 4 should be at 7, and 3 pi over 4 should be at 1. Good thing I caught that. So this graph looks something like this. I missed that line. That was terrible. And then it goes up. Rough sketch. My drawing is not perfect, but you get the general idea. So let's say if you want to graph 3 tangent 1 half x plus 1. This time we've got to calculate the period, which is pi over b, or pi over 1 half. So that's 2 pi. So to calculate the vertical asymptotes, set the inside equal to pi over 2. So if you multiply both sides by 2, you get pi. And set the inside equal to the other vertical asymptote, negative pi over 2. And so you get negative pi. The distance between negative pi and pi, as you can see, is 2 pi. Now between that it's going to be 0, between 0 and pi is pi over 2, and between negative pi and 0 is negative pi over 2. So those are our points of interest. The vertical shift is 1. And the graph goes up 3 units to 4, and down 3 to negative 2. So we have positive tangent, which is an increase in function. So at 0 it's going to be at the center line, at pi over 2 it's going to be up to 4 and at negative 5 of 2 down at negative 2. So the graph is going to look something like that. So that's it for graph and sine, cosine, secant, cosecant, and tangent functions. So now let's talk about solving triangles. So let's say if you have a right triangle and this is 40 degrees. This is x and this is 8. So you want to solve for x. So you have to pick the right trig function. The 40, 8 is opposite to the 40 and x is the hypotenuse. So using SOHCAHTOA, which works for right triangles, you have to use sine because you know sine is opposite of adjacent. Sine 40 is equal to the opposite side 8 over x. And then you can cross multiply. So you have x sine 40 is equal to 8. So x is 8 over sine 40. And so therefore, x is, let me make sure my calculator is in degree mode. So x is around 12.45. So if you have a right triangle, use SOHCAHTOA. But let's say if you want to solve for something and you don't have a right triangle. For example, let's say if you have this problem. Let's say this is 30 degrees. This is 5. 
this is 70, and this is x. You want to use the law of sines. Let's say that's angle A, B, and C. Across angle A is side A. Across angle B is side B. Across angle C is side C. The law of sine states that sine of A over A is equal to sine of B over B, which equals sine of C over C. So let's say that we want to solve for x. We're going to call this angle A. So this is side A. And this is angle B. We'll call this side B. So first you've got to find a missing angle. So the three angles of a triangle adds up to 180. So 180 minus 30 minus 70, that's like 180 minus 100. This has to be 80. So sine 80 across over the opposite side, which is x, is equal to sine 70 divided by the opposite side, which is 5. So let's cross multiply. So 5 sine 80 is equal to x sine 70. So if you solve for x, divide both sides by sine 70. X is equal to that. So go ahead and type that in your calculator. So 5 sine 80 divided by sine 70 is equal to 5.24. Notice that the larger angle um, is associated with the larger side. 5 is smaller than 5.24 because 70 is smaller than 80. So let's say if we have this problem. Let's say this is 40 degrees. This is x. This is 5. That's 8. So sine 40 across divided by the opposite sine, which is 8, equals sine of x divided by what's opposite to x, which is 5. So if we cross multiply, it's 5 sine 40 is equal to 8 sine x. So we're going to divide both sides by 8. So this time we're solving for an angle instead of a side. So we're going to have to do the inverse sign. 5 sine 40, well not the inverse, but you'll see. 5 sine 40 over 8 is this answer, 0 0.402. So this is sine x, by the way. I don't know why I wrote x. Sine of what angle is equal to 0 0.402? So take the inverse sine of 0 0.402. So you should get about 23.7 degrees. That's your answer. However, you have to be careful. You can get another answer. If you take 180 minus that answer, <coughs> you can also get this. Sine 156.3 is also about 0 0.402 if you type that in your calculator. So sometimes you can get two possible answers. But you got to check it. Here we have 40. 40 and 156 is greater than 180, so this can't work. So we got to eliminate it. If it was less than 180, it could be a possible answer. So we'll keep this one, 23.7. And then we could solve the rest of the triangle with the law of sines. So now let's go over the law of cosines. You want to use the law of cosines if you have any one of these three situations. If you have, let's say, an angle and two adjacent sides, and you want to find the opposite side, use law of cosines. Or if you have three sides and you want to find an angle, you use law of cosines. The equation is c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared minus 2, well, minus 2ab cosine of angle c. So we're going to call 7a, 8b, this is angle c, and side c is x. So x squared is equal to 7 squared plus 8 squared minus 2 times 7 times 8 cosine 40. And then just uh, just type that in and then take the square root of your answer. So 7 squared plus 8 squared. Type in exactly what you see. Minus 2, 7 times 8 cosine 40. So x squared is 27.2. And if you take the square root of that, x is 5.22. Now if you want to find the angle, Rearrange this equation. Use this one. c squared minus a squared minus b squared divided by negative 2ab is equal to cosine c. 
So c squared is 10 squared. a squared is 8. Not, b squared is 9 squared. Divided by 2 times 8 times 9. So let's just type that in. Um, you may have to use parentheses, though, if you're going to type it exactly the way you see it in your calculator. So you should get 0 0.3125 is equal to cosine of C. And then to solve for C, take, type in the inverse cosine of 0.3125. And then so angle C, which is X, is 71.79. That's the angle here. For inverse cosine, you don't need to do 180 minus that. You only get one answer. The last thing we're going to talk about is finding the area of a triangle. The first scenario is if you have a right triangle. Let's say if this is 10, this is 5. For a right triangle, area is 1 half base times height. So base is 5, height is 10. 10 times 5 is 50, half of 50 is 25. So that's what you got to do for a right triangle. But now let's say if you don't have a right triangle. Let's say if you have two sides and the included angle. How do you find the area? You want to use this equation. Area is 1 half AB sine of C. So if this is angle C, this is angle A, that's angle B. 8 is side A, side B is 10. So it's 1 half 8 times 10 sine of 30. Sine of 30 is on a unit circle, which is 1 half. 8 times 10 is 40. So a half times a half, well, half times 40 is 20, and half of 20 is 10. So your whole answer is 10. Notice that this equation looks very similar to 1 half base times height. This part is the same. A is like the base. B is like the height. The only thing that's missing is sine. For a right triangle, it's really sine of 90. And sine 90 is 1. So this equation, 1 half base times height, really comes from that equation. It's just that if you don't have a right triangle, you need the sine of C to figure it out. Now sometimes you're not given an angle. You may have a triangle that's not a right triangle and you're given all three sides. So if you don't have an angle, this is the equation that you want to use. First, find S. This is Huron's formula. S is A plus B plus C divided by 2. Basically, it's half of the perimeter. So it's 8 plus 9 plus 10 over 2. Excuse me. 8 plus 10 is 18, plus 9 is uh, 27. 20, so we have 27 over 2, which is 13.5. The area is the square root of s times s minus a, s minus b, s minus c. So it's the square root 13.5 times 13.5 minus 8, 13.5 minus 9 and then 13.5 minus 10. Well, let's not close the parentheses yet. So just type it exactly the way you see it in your calculator. If you try to do it step by step, it's going to take way too long. And you just don't have the time to do all of that on a test. you got to get the answer fast. Otherwise, you'll run out of time. Okay, if my math is correct, I got 34.2 if I type that incorrectly because it's very easy just to miss one number and then your whole answer is screwed so that's it for this video that covers pretty much the majority of what you need to know for your trig final there might be some other topics that I missed but for the most part that's most of it um, actually there's one more topic that I do need to mention and I realize that most students have a trouble with this one. Let's say if you have a car. I'm just going to draw a wheel. And you're given the radius of the wheel. Let's say it's uh, 5 feet. And the car, the car makes, the wheel makes, um, let's say, one revolution in 18 seconds. With this information, calculate the speed of the car, or this, the linear speed of the wheel, in miles per hour. 
Now you might see a question like this, and most students usually have a trouble with this one. The best way to answer it is to convert. So we have one revolution for every 18 seconds. We need to convert to miles per hour. Let's convert seconds to hour. So there are 60 seconds in one minute, and there are 60 minutes in one hour. That wasn't bad, was it? Notice the units that units seconds cancel and the units minutes cancel. So we have hours. Now we need to convert revolutions into miles. One revolution is like one complete rotation, which is uh, 2 pi radians per revolution. 2 pi is 360. So the units revolution cancel. So now we need to convert radians into feet. And that's where the radius comes in. The radius is the measure of a radian. Notice that the words sound similar, radius, radian. So if the radius is 5 feet, you need to understand that 1 radian is equal to 5 feet. So therefore, it's 5 feet per radian. And then your last step is to convert feet into miles. So 1 mile per 5,280 feet. And then you get the answer. So it's 60 divided by 18 times 60 times 2 pi times 5 divided by 5280. And what I got is about 1.19 miles per hour. This car is moving very slow. One rotation in 18 seconds is extremely slow. All right, let's say if you have a car that's moving at 26 miles per hour and the radius is the radius of the wheel, let's say it's um, 15 inches. You want to find the, so you have the linear speed, you want to find the angular speed in radians per second. So let's start with miles per hour. So we have 26 miles over one hour. Let's convert hours into seconds. So for every hour, <coughs> there's 60 minutes. And <coughs> for one minute, there's 60 seconds. So those units cancel. So next, let's convert miles into feet. There's 5,280 feet per one mile. And since we want inches, or we need to use inches, let's convert feet into inches. There's 12 inches in a foot. So miles cancel and the units feet cancel. So now that we have inches, we can use the radius to convert from inches to radians. And then we'll get the answer. Because we already have seconds here. So if the radius is 15 inches, that means that the measure of one radian is 15 inches. And so that's equal to 26 divided by 60 divided by 60 times 5280 times 12 divided by 15. And so we should get, or you should get 30.51 radians per second. Notice that we only have the units radians and seconds. Now sometimes you may get the same question where they give you the linear speed and the radius and they may want you to find rotations per minute. So everything that we've done here, you would have to repeat it, but we have to continue from this point. We need one more step. To convert to rotations per minute, you just got to convert radians to rotations. Rotations and revolutions are the same thing. For every two pi radians, you have one revolution or one rotation. So the units radians cancel, and you have revolutions per minute. I mean, not revolutions per minute, you have revolutions per second, which we can convert that to minutes if you want. All right, let me do a different example, but with converting to RPMs. So let's say if the speed is 42 miles per hour, and the radius is 18 inches. Convert it to RPMs, rotations per minute or revolutions per minute. So feel free to pause the video and try it. So we have 42 miles per hour. Now for this one, we don't want to convert to seconds. We want to convert to minutes. So one hour per 60 minutes. So that's all we're going to do with the units of time. Now let's convert miles into feet. So 5,280 feet per one mile. And then let's convert feet into inches. 
so 12 inches in a foot. And then let's use the radius to convert from inches to radians. So for every 18 inches, we have one radian. Our last step is to convert radians into um, revolutions. So 2 pi radians per 1 revolution. So we have revolutions per minute. So 42 divided by 60 times 5280 times 12 divided by 18 divided by 2 pi, which I would put in parentheses. Because your calculator would divide by 2 and then multiply by pi. So your answer is 392.2 revolutions per minute or RPMs, rotations per minute. So now I'm done with this video. So I wish you well on your 